Good morning, everybody. And I'd first like to first I'd like to um, offer some thanks to to Bic for the opportunity to speak today, and also for the PTA for putting on this session, and also extending an invitation um, NetBI is an online uh, data analytics company. We receive data from um, most of the systems across Australia from a public transport perspective. Uh, we're also branching out into other areas, I guess, as the concept of the smart city evolves um, and permeates industry. Um, public transport data is, is, forms a very important part of that, but it is only one part of it. Um, we've now uh, received data from the taxi industry as well. We're also getting information from parking, um, and as well with some recent work we're doing with transport and main roads in Queensland, we're now receiving all of the data from the road segments uh, across the state. Uh, we've got that in an historical sense, it's feeding on a daily basis, and we've also just uh, automated a, a real-time feed of that information. And what's fascinating with that data is what you can actually do when you fuse it, and the potential and the possibilities that become available from that. Um, the theme today, rather than me trying to talk broadly about something uh, and cover lots of different aspects, I thought I'd take a very narrow view and take a deep dive and try and address some of the issues that have been raised in a number of talks today. Um, Wayne, for example, mentioned before about the issues with KPIs and the ability or inability to get changes through to timetables. Uh, and part of Tony's talk yesterday with New South Wales, where they're setting some vision for these things, um, they're looking at a number of different options. Obviously, we've all got a crystal ball, um, but I can tell you mine's very, very cloudy in this space and trying to predict the future is almost impossible as things are changing around us very quickly. Um, but one thing I will note in that screen is we're, we're up with about 20 billion transactions within NetBI today. Um, most of our customers have data going back to about 2004. So we've got over a decade's worth of data from all of these systems you can see on the board here. Obviously, GoCards is a system in southeast Queensland. We also have the rest of the ticketing data from throughout the regions. Um, Smart Riders, Perth, MyWays, Canberra, Green Cards, Tasmania, Opals, New South Wales, and the Tapra and Ride, obviously, with the Northern Territory. So we're in a fairly unique position with that data that we manage on behalf of our, our customers, um, with the contracts that we have in place with the state government agencies, and obviously the reciprocal arrangements that we provide with services for operators to also have access to that data. So I'd really like to try and address to see if we can't remove some of these obstacles that um, uh, speakers prior to us today have, have mentioned. And we'll go through and have a look at a couple of narrow areas. I'm not sure that I'll get time to get onto the vehicle trips, but let's start with something really, really basic, uh, timetables. I think we all have a good understanding of timetables of what they are, and everyone, uh, the other speakers prior to me have mentioned some difficulties in getting changes through. And that's both from a regulatory perspective and an operator perspective. Well, with this wealth of data we have, what opportunities do we have to improve that scenario? Now, very quickly, um, timetables are normally just a sequence of, uh, sequence of times through a series of stops. Um, but timetables impact frequency, efficiencies, cost, customer experience, mobility, and connectedness. Obviously, timetables form a major part of uh, service targets under a contract, and normally authorities mandate with operators that they meet either a certain percentage on time running or perhaps a measure a degree of headway in high frequency services and areas like London and, and uh, Singapore obviously which uh, look at it from a customer perspective where they're measuring things like passenger weighted minutes in, in high frequency services. We've heard these characteristics of timetables mentioned by other speakers throughout the day and yesterday. Um, these are mostly fixed. Timetables are not seasonal. Uh, Vitzka's in her presentation mentioned the new technologies that are coming on board and allow us to be a bit more agile or flexible with these, um, replacing the paper um, uh, poster stuck to the sign at the bus stop. Uh, we're now looking to introduce more mobile technologies. Those sort of things obviously bring us a capability to move and react and adapt a little bit quicker. Um, but even today, we haven't yet moved out of the space of changing timetables, certainly more than once a year. Um, the timetable it's set is normally an annual timetable, yet when we look at the data, the data tells us a very, very different story. Not every timetable has seasonality, but many do. In other words, we can run a lot faster in our services over school holidays and Christmas periods, yet we don't change our timetable. And then if we've got a contract to meet those service performances, how does that affect our contract delivery and what happens to our service target to that point in time? Um, in the past, we've had things like clock-face timetables, 
that allows us to communicate with our customers a little bit easier by telling them, you know, at five past or 15 past or 25 past, your bus will turn up. Let's get to the stop at that particular point in time. Um, in reality, when we look at the data, that also doesn't work. Um, and I'll show you some examples of those shortly. Um, stops are not all equal. Um, in a, in a, throughout a particular route, we might have some contract points. Um, those contract points are typically only those where the, our performance under the contract is measured. Uh, we also have timing points and other service stops. Uh, and as Wayne mentioned before uh, this morning in the panel session, um, the operators might come up and design a timetable, but then they've got to go and seek approval from a regulator to make changes to that. And often the operator at that point in time has done months and months and months worth of work to evaluate the performance of the services and then the regulator is faced with exactly the same scenario on their side of the fence to go through the approval process to do that. So surely there's got to be a better way. Um, this is a typical graph of on-time running. It's looking at the performance on a daily basis over a year and a half. And we can see in this instance that we're running at about the mid-70s. Mid now that's considering the definition of on-time running. Every city has a different tolerance. Um, for example, they might be, say, one minute early to four minutes late, as they are here in Perth but every city has a slightly different definition of that, and that's measured for every trip at every stop. Patterns in data tell us a lot about what's going on, and we can learn from these patterns, and if I get a couple of minutes right at the end, I'll show you what we, how we apply these, trip, these timetable patterns to trip patterns so we can learn from those things as well. Patterns help us classify the data just as we segment, segment our customer basis in terms of frequent travellers or school commuters or um, shift workers, etc., etc. Et we can apply those learnings and those techniques to data to understand what's going on. Now, the graphs that I've got there in front of you, they're trying to show us the running time profile for a particular trip. Um, the blue horizontal line, if we can all imagine that, is zero deviation from the timetable. So in other words, at every stop, we have a zero second difference. That's our perfect running timetable. Now, the examples we have in red are what we see in every city today. Um, there's a few more than this, but these are the, the predominant common ones. Obviously, we call this the late runner because this trip starts on time, but the further we run it, the, the more we get behind schedule. Um, there's a number of timetables out there that I'm sure everybody's familiar with that looks like that. The converse is that is the early runner. While we might again start on time, by the time we get to the end of the trip, we end up early, which is suggesting there's too much time in that timetable. The ideal candidate is where we run a horizontal timetable. Incidentally, it doesn't really matter where that line is, whether it's sitting up here, or down here, as long as it's horizontal. Once it's horizontal, we know we have the running time about right for that particular trip. If that line is very high on the page, chances are it's the trip prior to us in the shift that's caused the problem, but let's not try and solve this problem with this timetable because this is not where the issue is. It lies prior to us. Um, we can also detect when incidents occur. Um, obviously, a, a service might be running on time and then all of a sudden, if there's a massive jump where we're now running behind schedule, uh, we can detect that in the data with accidents and all those sorts of things. Um, we might have a cut and replacement trip. In other words, a bus started a trip, but we didn't see anything um, beyond a certain series of stops. And if we see this sort of thing, obviously a, a, a different uh, bus or driver may have, um, may have taken over to do that. A couple of other factors really affect timetables and our abilities to, to do them, and it's about clustering. This is an example of um, a running time profile similar to the patterns I showed you just before, but it's exactly the same trip every day in the month. Now what we can notice, oops, what we can notice here, uh, that is 300 seconds. So there's a very, very tight cluster of departures from the first stop within about 150 seconds of each other's. Um, we can see an incident that's occurred on this particular trip here, but there's a very tight clustering. We're missing some data out at the middle. Um, but overall, that's exactly the type of time pipe table, or that's the type of running time profile we all would love to see because it means we can easily design a timetable for that and we can meet a very high on-time running target as a consequence. However, we also have these types of services. Um, we call, I've, I've labelled this the rooster tail. Most of these trips start within about 140 seconds of each other, but by the time we get to the last stop, there's about a thousand second spread and you'll notice that spread is uniform. It's pretty evenly distributed. Now, given our definition, if I go back to the tolerance of one minute early to four minutes late, how are we gonna timetable that service? It's, not, it's, it's physically not possible to timetable that service given that variability of running times 
In this instance, that's multiple drivers, it's not the same driver, and obviously there's some issues, there's some underlying issues there. Now that we have the road and traffic data within Queensland, we're able to look at this in a lot more detail, and a lot of this on-time running comes down to the reliability of the road network on which the services are operating. Clearly in that example there, we don't have an issue with the reliability of the road network. The real, it, it doesn't matter whether it's fast or slow or it really deteriorates in the peak, as long as the same thing happens every given day, we can timetable it. However, when we get variability, we end up with that sort of thing, and it's very, very difficult to timetable. Now, there's a whole lot of really interesting factors that come into this when you have this situation. For example, if that's the first trip for the sh driver's shift, what do we do for recovery? Obviously, we build in time. Now, when we're building time, we're slowing services down, we're adding costs, we're reducing the customer experience, etc., etc. but there's little other choice. But what if we knew where these services, well, these trips were, would it affect how we, as, as schedulers, block our trip patterns and achieve that outcome? It would be much more efficient to block a whole lot of trips like that together than to intersperse these types of trips in all of our different blocking patterns. So when we really understand our data and we've got a lot of detail, there's a whole lot of new opportunities that come to the fore. One thing we've done at NetBI is to automate the timetable. And I'll come back and have a look at this in terms of how we apply these things in contract administration and the outcomes of those. But if I just quickly go through, tell you what we've done, we'll look at some results that have been um, attained, attained around Australia. And we've got some permission, particularly from Canberra today, so I thank them very much for the opportunity to use their data. They're one of the first cities that put a lot of this into practice, as others are now doing and we can have a look at some of these results. But what we've done at NetBI, because we have so much data, um, all the vehicles have now got GPS on board, we receive next week's timetable, typically a few days in advance. So every city is giving us their, their plan or their operational plan, typically two or three days in advance for what they're going to do next week. Once we know what those trips are, what we then do is go and look back over the last 12 months and see exactly how those trips have run, and we develop and we reverse engineer near the GPS data to come up with what we determine as an optimal timetable. So not only do we get the timetable the scheduling system has for next week, but we also develop this alternate optimal timetable. Now in many instances they're, they're exactly the same, but in a number of instances obviously they're very, very different. We've got, to cleanse season, we've got to cleanse the data, we've got to remove the seasonality, we've got to detect the incidents and remove all those variations from the data to come up with this optimal timetable. The timetable is optimised at the trip level, so again, this concept of clock face doesn't really apply. We're trying to come up with how can we make the best, most efficient use of the data and bring about efficiencies and savings in operations. Once we generate these timetables for next week, as the actual GPS data comes in, not only can we compare it against the current scheduled timetable, but we can also compare it against the optimised timetable. What do we see? Um, these charts on the left, these two charts, the left hand side and the right hand side are exactly the same. You'll just notice that a different line is highlighted on the left. Um, there's a concept of a green area and a red area. The green area is simply denoting on time. So when we're be within one minute to four minutes of on time running, we're considered green, we're in the good zone. Uh, if we're outside of that, we're in the red zone, we're not, obviously not on time. On the left hand side, we can see currently that trip runs at 21.5% on time. Now, what's very interesting in this diagram, if I take this example here, the degree where we start behind schedule here is on time, and by the time we end up uh, at our last stop, you'll notice that, that line is about horizontal. So we're equidistant from our start to our end point. That suggests we've got the right amount of time in, in running time overall. However, because we end up late, early, late, back on time and we recover all that again, the time is just horribly distributed throughout the trip. And you'll notice a very, very similar pattern reoccurring for that trip all the time. On the right hand side is exactly the same actual data compared to what we've generated as, a, as an optimal timetable. Again, you'll notice that we've got this much flatter line. Um, we're not always on time. Obviously, if we start late, we've got a problem because we're going to be late. Because in this timetable, drivers can't lose time and they can't make time up. We've, we've got just the right amount. So in this instance, perhaps we need to have a look at other issues prior to the shift, or you'll notice now we've, we've actually got up to nearly 80% on time running, which is not too bad. Here's another classification. This particular trip, we always start on time, but we ended up early. And again, what's happened?
happen in this example, we're able to move, remove a lot of that excess time from the timetable, it's not needed, and in this case we've gone from 37.3% on time to over 99% on time, and clearly a good result that everybody would like to achieve. That's at the micro level, that's at a trip level. So how does this aggregate? How does this look from a network-wide perspective? Well, these two lines show us that example. Again, that blue line is very similar to the one I initially showed. That's a, oops, sorry, that's a daily uh, result of on-time running. And the red line is exactly the same scenario that would have been achieved against improvements in the timetable. Um, we've got an 8.3% overall improvement in the on-time running. That's every trip at every stop. And again, that may not be the definition that's in the contract, but nevertheless, we can see that we're improving the on-time running, which obviously has a direct result on the customer experience. And from the analysis we've done of, of this in every city where we've done it to date, certainly there's a number of timetables that don't need to change. Equally, there's some timetables where we need to add more time in it. But by far in advance, there's, uh, there's, there's residual time in the timetable that's simply not required. And by removing that, as in some of the examples I showed you at the trip level before, um, we've, we've worked out there's, in this particular example, there's 10 to 15 million dollars worth of savings in this simply by removing that uh, in-service running time that's not required. Um, we're not sure of that exact figure. Obviously, the operators have to go through a blocking exercise with their vehicles to work out how much of that time is actually saved or not. But nevertheless, that serves as a, as a goal to, uh, or, 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 a, or a range of, of savings that can be made, which are fairly significant. Um, this is just another look on a, uh, a particular shift level. This is a driver shift. Again, we've got a low bar, which is the one minute early, high bar, four minutes late. And we'd like all of our services, obviously, to run in that case. There's 10 trips there in the driver shift. And in this instance, we can see the driver typically starts late and ends up very, very early. Now, when we factored this in to say, well, why would a driver always start late when they're actually arriving at the last stop of the previous trip early? Well, the driver's actually doing the right thing. The drivers know where the, the, the majority of customers are catching that service, and if they actually let, if they started each one of these trips on time, there's no way those passengers would be picked up because they'd be running through those stops five minutes early. So in this case, the drivers actually know there's an issue with the timetable, and they're reacting to it, to, to it themselves. So that was a, a very interesting learning with that, and obviously once some changes have been made, we can see that we can get uh, some very significant improvements in it. This is some data out of uh, Canberra, and again, I thank them for the opportunity to present this. This is where we can see they've taken some, taken some intervention, and they've got a res uh, an improved result of 8% overall in their running time, and have some saved significantly in terms of the late running. What are the results of all this? Well, timetables can be automated. Now, we've heard from other speakers that timetables typically take them a year to construct and get it through and get approved. Um, well, we compute them every week. Um, that's available now, today. Um, it's a real opportunity for both operators and regulators when they see the data and they see the facts. Um, I think it takes a lot of heat out of the argument, uh, take a lot of angst out of the decision, and we're really putting the facts on the table. When, we can, when both parties can equally have access to those facts, we think there's a real opportunity to improve the scenario and how we've been doing things today. Um, Timetables, because we compute them every week, it certainly doesn't mean you change them every week, um, but they're there to be tested every week. And when the deviation from where you currently are is sufficient, obviously that's the signal or the time to start making these deployments. The other beauty with this approach is it doesn't have to be a big bang. You don't have to do everything all the time at the same time. Uh, obviously we're generating optimal timetables for every trip we perform next week, but I think the, the approach going forward would be one of an iterative rolling schedule rather than, hey, there's 50 or 60 services we have to improve. Why, why can't we do five or ten of them on, on, a, on a monthly basis and pick the targets ones that are going to give us the best result in that sort of, in that sort of time frame? Um, we, we've achieved about th between three and twenty percent of improvements across cities when we've, we've looked at this analysis. There's significant savings in all case. Um, one of the really interesting things we found too with looking at customer complaints and logs, customers were complaining that their buses are late. Well, the buses actually generally aren't late, the buses are early. They're only complaining they're late because they missed that one and had to catch the next one. So we find that the feedback we're looking at in some systems doesn't always correlate and support the, the data we're seeing from a, from a few. Um, so if we can compute these optimal timetables, well, what does that mean from a contract perspective? 
Well, let's just go through a, a quick example. Perth was one of the first cities to get these technologies introduced and live in the field. Smart cards, as Phil mentioned in his talk, um, GPS, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in the early days, Perth came up with a target and set it for operators, and their target was 85% on time. Um, Melbourne was typically the next city to go, and obviously Melbourne has to be better than Perth, so Melbourne picked 90%, and the next one we saw was Sydney. And Sydney then went out and have picked a 95% target. So we can definitely see a pattern there, and it would certainly take a bright politician to announce that we're gonna actually accept, accept a target that's below what somebody else has set. Clearly we can't be performing as well as them. Well, when we look at the timetables we've created at a trip level, at a micro level, and we look at that then and al analyze that at a macro level, it's also telling us for a given basket of routes and most contracts in Australia are area-based, the underlying road conditions in each of those areas is vastly different. And as I said before, now we're getting the road data through, we can actually detect exactly that scenario on the road basis. But in the way we optimise the timetable, we also take into account automatically the variability of the road network, the patronage and seasonality of the data. So when we analyse this, when we roll this data up, we can actually compute an optimal on-time running target, not only for a city overall, but we can then break that down into each contract area. And what we're finding is if we do set that target, and let's assume that we know that optimal target for just one moment, can we do better? Can we go higher? Let's, let's say we compute an optimal target of 85%. Can we actually achieve higher on-time running than 85%? Well, the answer is yes. But to do that, we have to add time into the timetable. We have to dwell when we're early. We lower the customer experience, and we're causing congestion. So with this ability to not only compute and optimise timetables at an individual trip level, we also now have the ability to compute them exactly what they should be at a contractor level. And because we're looking at a rolling 12 month set of data, as those things change, we've got a much more agile process. I think we're taking a lot of heat and a lot of angst out of the discussions, and it's a process that I think operators and regulators can work in a continual manner to move this thing forward and remove a lot of the obstacles and the complaints. Um, two final conclusions there. First, force majeure or not, do we include them or not? Um, based on the fact that we have all of the data, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, what's going to change probably is two things. The level of administration you put into the contracts to measure them and agree that that is a majeure and that should be excluded. And the second one is your target. If you exclude force majeure events, obviously you expect your on-time running to be a lot higher, so your target will, your target will be higher. Conversely, if you're going to leave them all in there, perhaps you're going to lower some administration, but conversely, your target has to be lowered. And the last piece of advice on that, let's automate and don't administer KPIs. The data is there, it's available today to do these sort of things. I think there's a real unique opportunity to remove a lot of the administration and a lot of the effort that both parties go to today to take advantage of that. Um, just quickly on trip occupancy patterns, we can look at the same thing from a trip perspective. That purple line there represents the seating capacity of a trip, and we have these typical profiles that come up. Uh, we can see we have an overcrowded trip because we're at or exceeding license capacity of the vehicle all the way through. Obviously, we're not carrying any passengers on these sort of trips. Uh, we have trips where we have low occupancy, high occupancy. We may have patronage at the start, nothing at the end, or conversely, nothing at the start, lots of passengers at the end. Here's an example of a trip throughout the times of the day. Uh, we're exceeding seating capacity in that period, so no longer do we have to make decisions that we need to run more frequently in the peak period, because we can find out that we've got a problem for a 40 minute period, not a three hour period. So let's address the problem, let's solve it. Once we can get a lot more surgical in our strikes or our targets, we can be a lot more effective with it. And obviously those sort of trips run in every city today. Uh, they are very, very common. And obviously there's lots of dollars tied up in those services that we can very much optimise. Um, just following in Phil's footsteps, uh, a couple of quotes, there's a couple of good ones in there. I won't go through the rest of that today, right now because I know I'm out of time, but just one. Um, data mining is a noun. Uh, it's about torturing data until it confesses, and if you torture it enough, it will confess to anything. Thank you. Thanks for your time this morning. <laughs>